you know, test this on yourself, Julian. When you're going well, when you're having a good period of time and, and you feel like you're performing, these four things will be in place. You're achieving meaningful outcomes. So you feel like you're making progress, goals, and so on. You're developing and growing. So there's a level of stretch, a level of growth in skills, capabilities, and so on. There's a level of energy and enjoyment in what you're doing. So there's more energy in than there's energy out. There's certainly going out, but there's some coming back in. It's being replenished. And then the final one is there the, there will be some people around you who are strong collegiate relationships who you can trust as partners. So if you think of the four letters, aid, up, achieve, develop, enjoy, partner, that's where I start with any leader. And Welcome to another episode of Executive Health and Life. I'm your host, Julian Hayes II, back at it again, as I always say, with another fascinating guest. And today I'm speaking with a gentleman who played first-class cricket before retiring early to pursue a career as a performance psychologist. He's now one of Australia's leading performance psychologists. He stepped into a high-profile career. He's working with top executive teams of international corporations, the Australian Test Cricket Team, Olympic gold medalists, among many others. I'm speaking with Graham Winter, who was the three-time um, Chief Psychologist City Australian Olympic Team. He's also the founder of the consulting firm Think One Team Consulting and a five-time best-selling author, including the newest book that they have, Toolkit for Turbulence. Without further ado, Graham, how are you doing this morning? <laughs> Julian, I'm doing really well. Thank you. It's lovely to, lovely to spend the time with you. Well, I appreciate it. Uh, it's, it's very interesting how you know we're so connected now in this world now that it's it's it, nearly evening time for me and it's morning time for you. So I'm always fascinated by technology and just how it's just so easy to connect this now. It does make it so easy, doesn't it? Which, uh, I mean, it has its upsides, but it has its, has its challenges about the amount of stuff that we're dealing with as well. But then the opportunities are just fantastic. So mm -hmm. and this is one of those. So lovely to spend the time with you. It is. And so I always love to go back into the past before coming to the present and then looking into the future. And so if I was going to meet you, if we met you as a teenager, would we be surprised of the work you're doing now or would it be expected? It's a really interesting question. My parents, I think if they'd said as a 15 year old would say, Graham has no idea what he wants to do. So they sent me to get this vocational guidance testing with a psychologist. Um, and the psychologist, I remember, came out with two recommendations. You could do law or do accounting. I hated maths, so that was out of the question. Um, my father was like, well, okay, maybe you do law. And I said, no, 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 I want to do what the guy who was doing the testing was doing. I'm going to be a psychologist. And that was from that moment on. Um, so I think if you'd got me at six, probably 16 and a half, um, I would have said, I'm going to be a psychologist. Um, I'm going to be working with people in business, um, helping them to be good at their jobs. And um, <laughs> here we are 40, <laughs> 50 years later, and we're, yeah, we're still going. Yeah. And so um, another, you know, the sport of cricket, that I'm not familiar with it that much. <laughs> I, I've seen it through the grapevine, heard about it. So yeah. I, I'm, um, I guess the first thing is, what got you interested in cricket? I have no idea. I can never remember not playing with a bat and a ball. So I guess it's probably like kids in the States. They, they grow up playing baseball. We grew up playing cricket. And mm -hmm. um I was pretty good at it, um, so I got the rewards from that, and, and then yeah, I subsequently went on and played um, played in two sort of championship winning teams in Australia. So we won the uh, the sort of long form game and the short form game. Um, but then I retired pretty early because I was trying to juggle a, um, a an early career with Coopers and Lybrand um, alongside playing first class cricket, um, and then yeah, the opportunity, which I'm sure we'll talk about, to go into the sports psychology area arose and. Um, yeah, I, I decided that I'd achieve what I wanted to in cricket and um, there were other things that looked really exciting on the horizon. So I headed for those. Yeah, that was going to be one of my questions because typically when you typically athletes are usually forced to retire just due to maybe not being able to do the, the, the job as well anymore. Or if you're a boxer, you just get knocked out one too many times. And so mm -hmm. you don't go back yeah. in the ring. And so it sounded like for you, you were still performing at a high level at cricket and still making this transition to this other world so uh, did you have, have any initial questioning of like am i is this the right time to make this move and to, to go all in on this thing 
Um, I think if it was these days, I would have because now cricket's so professional. So the the what's called the the Big Bash, like the twenty twenty league, and the, the World Championships are on in the states and um, West Indies uh, over the next few months. Um, so I think if I if it had been in that situation, you know, I would have had a contract, I would have had a good income, and potentially a sort of six eight year um, horizon, something like that. But um, yeah, we were trying to juggle doing this tra traveling nationally playing and then coming back and working um so for me honestly it was a no-brainer i i wanted to play first class cricket i didn't think i was good enough to get into the national team um and um as it turned out the uh the then coach of the local cricket team the state cricket team that i was playing in was also on the board of the institute of sport and they were looking for a psychologist and um the guy who ran it was one of our top football coaches um and he was adamant that he said, I don't, well, I don't want somebody that's university specifically trained in sports psychology because there really wasn't anything in Australia in those days. You, it was really probably States, Canada and so on. Uh, he said, I want somebody who's playing elite sport. Um, so it was a pretty short list. <laughs> I think I might have been the list. <laughs> mm -hmm. And away okay. we went. So interesting. So we're going to fast forward a little bit kind of on your your career trajectory and probably um, go to something that probably a lot of people are interested in. And you probably talk about a decent amount of times uh, it is the uh, getting involved with the Olympic teams there and 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 doing that. So I guess the, the first time you're doing that, I would think it's a feeling of, wow, this is pretty cool, but it's pretty high stakes. And I guess at, at that point in your time, did you have did you feel fully prepared for it or or was this um did you because sometimes i guess i'm i'm getting at um sometimes mm. we have this thing of feeling like an imposter or saying are we truly ready for this moment or something yeah i think the thing that i mean it was a bit weird because we were we'd been briefed and yeah we were i mean we were um trying to help athletes to cope with a, an, an event that can very easily overwhelm them um, and then you walk into it yourself and go, oh, my goodness. Um, it's like 26, 28 world championships. There are more media here than there are athletes. Um, it is, you know, just as, as I mean, I always remember one moment when one of our Australian teams said to me one day, uh, it was their, their day of their competition, and they said, I'm not ready. It can't be today. Um, and for every Olympic athlete, it's, it's always something they're working towards, and then suddenly it's today. Um, so yeah, I think it took a little while, but then, um, I used to switch into professional mode, you know what you need to do. Um, and, um, and obviously I, I, I was fabulous. I, I just had a fabulous team around me, the Australian Olympic team, the leadership, the medical team, the, the coaching team and so on. I've always been incredibly professional. Um, so that made that very easy to, to be able to operate in that environment. But yeah, I think it's a good point that, that early phase, it's, and, and athletes find that as well. It's very easy to get, just just lose your attention. Yeah, and the swimmer, swimmer's got to stay in their lane. It's so easy to get distracted by all these other things going on, and that's the biggest challenge. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and speaking of attention, uh, I think this is a great segue as we start to dive into psychological resilience. But I was doing some research, and I actually found something interesting. I think you typed it or tweeted it um, four or five years ago, ironically. And um, you were talking about focus and the power of it. And, yep. and I love the way you broke that down. You had a short where you talked about the state of what is, and you had the medium, which is talking about what if, and you yep. said, this is like the danger zone. This is where anxiety lives. Then you had the the longer term, which is the why not, where mm -hmm. you have vision, purpose, and hope. And yep. when I think about this, that makes sense. But maybe I'm wrong on this, but I have a feeling that most of us live in that medium zone a lot of times. <laughs> And so what, what what are some of the first things that you do to help us get out of that medium zone and either get in that short or that long-term zone? Um, I think a lot of it's got to do with awareness of your mindset um, and that natural human tendency to want certainty. Um, you know, when I finish this, I, <clears throat> I just said, we're at the start of the day here in Australia. And my, my next two meetings, one's with the CEO of, uh, they run a big travel leisure um, business all around Australia. And then uh, the next one runs the defense agency. Um, both of them have said to me in, in different ways over the last couple of months, um, my people all want certainty. I can't give them certainty. Um, and my, my point is, no, but you can't give them clarity. Um, and to me, clarity is that ability to be able to go out a couple of horizons 
Um, and Bob Johansson from the Institute of Future talked about this three or four years ago, this sort of notion of go out into the future, be clear what, what your vision is, what your purpose is, what you're heading towards, what your intent is, then come back to the present um, what are my core values? Yeah, what are the critical things I need to do? And it's one of the reasons things like agile works as a as a, as a sort of a process um, that it then enables you to focus on what's in front of you and deal with it. So I think it's it is a little bit mechanical, but it's also that awareness that as human beings we are um, we do have this tendency to to very easily be taken away from our current focus by wanting to control the future or yeah wanting more certainty. And um, I think that's often the challenge. Yeah. When we hear the word performance or psychological resilience, what, how would you explain that to someone? Someone comes up to you and says, Hey, Graham, um, what is psychological resilience? I hear this word a lot of times. Um, it probably applies in a couple of different ways. I think, I think there's the, the, the resilience that we might expect when people experience a really significant setback or challenge. Um, and that's ability to you know, dust yourself off and um, learn from that and, uh, and be able to move forward again. Um, and then I think this is the thing that we're experiencing. And then, yes, the thing that we covered in the, the, the recent book, Toolkit for Turbulence, this whole sort of concept of the, the concept that we're having this regular turbulence. So, so to some extent, resilience is that ability to kind of hold your hold hold your sort of intent. What we talked about a few moments ago. It's keep, keep in mind what your intent is, recognizing that, you know, and the metaphor I use with most of my business clients is your organization's like a fleet of yachts. Um, and we have a sense of where we want to go. Um, but we're going to have to navigate our way through that. And, and the resilience to me is the ability to retain that sense of confidence and purpose in what you're doing. Um, and then to be able to manage your own energy and and so on. Many things that, you know, many things that you, you cover regularly in your podcast, that whole sense of how do I maintain my level of energy and focus and confidence and so on in an environment that quite easily depletes or degrades that. And, and that's where some of the Olympic experience, I think, is quite helpful because you you get almost a, an amplified experience of what that's like and gives you a chance to sort of test out stuff as well. Yeah, I was going to, that was kind of going to be one of my points as well in terms of, I would think that going to talk to the CEO, which we're going to do after this uh, call yeah. here, those, those are pressures, especially there's a lot of people that are probably at that company and that organization. And there's a, that's a lot of people there that not even including the families. So that's a very high pressure, high stakes situation, just exactly. like the, the athlete that's performing for the representing the country. And especially you did the Sydney Olympics as well, right? Yeah, I did. Yeah. 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 So that, I mean, that probably felt even more pressure. Oh yeah. <laughs> to, to <do> this. <laughs> oh yeah. We were, yeah. It was made very clear to us. <laughs> I can only imagine. And, and so in that situation, what are, I guess, some of the, the first steps in terms of getting our composure and centering ourselves to navigate this pressure in, in this moment? Yeah, great, great question. Um, I've developed this little framework uh, to about, I don't know, 15 years ago now or something. So it was post the sport area, but it was when a particular sort of reasonably large organisation sort of came to me and said, um, and they're actually looking at their performance management system. So their, their sort of regular performance appraisals and so on. And they said, we think our system's ridiculous. Um, it gives us feedback months after things have happened. Um, everybody sees it as an administrative process and it seems to damage the relationship between our leaders and, and, their, and people. Could you sort of come up with something a little bit different? Um, and it was a great little brief. So we went back to the basics of sports psychology and performance psychology and said, okay, well, let's, if what we're wanting to do is to sustain performance, let's start by defining what we mean by performance. And we came up with this quite simple acronym, which was sort of based on the research. And the acronym is ADEP. So, you know, test this on yourself, Julian. When you're going well, when you're having a good period of time and, and you feel like you're performing, these four things will be in place. You're achieving meaningful outcomes. You feel like you're making progress, goals, and so on. You're developing and growing. So there's a level of stretch, a level of growth in skills, capabilities, and so on. There's a level of energy and enjoyment in what you're doing. So there's more energy in than there's energy out. There's certainly going out, but there's some coming back in. It's being replenished. And then the final one is there, the, there will be some people around you who are strong collegiate relationships who you can trust as partners. So if you think of the four letters, ADEP, achieve, develop, enjoy, partner. That's where I start with any leader. And the, def the defence person I'm talking to in a, in a few hours' time 
that's really where we are going to be with them because it's reasonably early days working with them. It's mm -hmm. helping them to understand what's important to you and then we'll put that into horizons, so maybe a year or two, but we'll then bring that back into 60, 90-day um, horizons and that's how I'll work with him. That's how I'll, how, how I'll get him to work with his teams around how do we create an environment in which people can achieve meaningful outcomes, develop and grow, enjoy what they're doing with energy and partnering. And with, with their teams and equally with themselves at any given moment, they will need to find different ways of dealing with that. Um, and, and personally, I've got a meeting, I'm trying to think what day of the week it is now. We, we, we're on, I think, I think it's uh, just just started. So I've got, a, I've got a meeting with my coach on Friday. Um, mm -hmm. I catch up with him about every three months. We will be sitting down with the ADEP framework. He will be asking me questions. Where's the energy? What's that been like? Um, you know, did we did you, did you get to the achievement? What didn't you get to? Okay, next phase, what do you want to do? So now I've got on that a little bit, but I would really encourage people to think about ADEP as a framework. So I think it's so simple um, and it's just proven to be so effective in all sorts of different ways for individuals, but also for boosting engagement in teams, which is to some extent the holy grail um, if you're a team leader and a, and a business leader. I love that concept. I absolutely love that concept. And you know, that got me thinking, you're absolutely correct. Um, when that thing is going really well, <clears throat> there's at times where, I mean, yeah. hope people don't hear this too much because I talk, you know, health is supposed to be my, my subject and I talk about it, but I can even go on little sleep. Like yeah. I don't even need as much required sleep because you have this natural energy you do, don't you? Yeah. 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 And and so it's, it's, yeah. um, and I think that's one of the things of how we see certain presidents live longer and athletes just live longer. And you see how can they go about having short sleep or such high stress. And I think it's yes. just ADEP yes. here that is a key intangible of that, that is, is helping them, you know, bypass what, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. Um, so with that said, out of that, out of those four, which one is usually one of the ones that most people would struggle with if you had to pick? Um, it's an interesting one because what, from what you were just saying a couple of moments ago, what I'm always trying to do is help people to understand what is what is right for you. You're a unique individual. Um, you're a high performer in your own right. And it's uh, one of the best gifts that the, the person I use as a coach ever gave me when he said, don't try and copy what somebody else is doing. You're not trying to live the life of somebody working inside an organisation for 30 or 40 years. You're trying to create your own um, your own life. So let's understand what each of those are. So, I mean, accepting that individuals will have different elements. So almost, I'd probably answer it in two ways then. One would be in any given 60, 80, 90, 100 day, 120 day period, as you've highlighted, people will have a deficit or an excess in one of those. So there'll be a big achievement piece. You know, like I, I, myself and my co-author, Martin Bean, wrote the, the Toolkit for Turbulence book early last year. We worked massive hours to put that in. The energy dropped away. Some of the partnering and relationships dropped away. Um, the development was pretty good, but it was narrow. Um, to me, then, a good coach and myself was then trying to replenish those later as well. And in some respects, it's probably those last two that are most often likely to suffer if you look then more across the board. It's the not investing in your own energy um, and enjoyment, particularly for your high performers who are very driven. Um, and sometimes it's the partnering. It's, um, I mean, one of, the, one of the little phrases I use a lot with my clients is people first, task close behind. So it's just kind of remembering that, yeah, no, we got a lot of stuff to do. The numbers aren't looking good. I know my first conversation this morning will be under pressure from the board. I haven't quite hit the numbers in the first quarter. Um, yep, okay, how do we approach this people first, task close behind? Because the danger is the person will start to dive in and try and yeah, tackle all that themselves rather than, how do I mobilise my people? How do I bring creativity to this challenge? Um, that's, that often is the issue when you've got these big sort of issues coming yeah, and I, I tend to think as we're as we're drawing parallels so between the athletic world and then the the business world, yeah, yeah. and uh, especially with early stage entrepreneurs as well, we can throw them in there as well, and I can I can attest to this as well that I tend to think mm. that something that's very vulnerable is our self worth because a lot yeah. of times it's predicated yeah. on our output, on our performance, and our achievement. So yeah. what are what are some kind of tools that you go about in helping a lot of these people with uh, kind of preserving their self worth and and being able to separate their identity from kind of their vocation and their and their job? Yeah, I think you partly answered what you, you, you've almost answered the question there. It's that conversation about who are you? 
who am I? Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm a psychologist, but I'm also a father. I'm a grandfather. I'm a writer. I'm a, um, I'm, a, I'm attempting the wing surf. Um, yeah, a, a variety of other things. I, I'm, I'm a very avid sort of fitness person. Yeah, I'm a reader. Um, and then you go, okay, and then underneath that, who are you? Well, I'm, I think I'm a pretty creative sort of person. I'm, so it's trying to understand the who are you. Um, and then, um, I mean, the language I'll often use is um, I want to try and create the environment in which we can help you to bring your superpowers. What are you? What are your superpowers? Um, but those superpowers are in your whole life, not just in um, not just in the workplace. And I think that is for most of the business people I deal with, as you say, the, the, the early stage entrepreneurs, you know, we've got a couple of tech companies we work with. They're under massive pressure from the, the capital markets to, you know, mm -hmm. keep, particularly recently, you know, keep hitting profit when previously maybe it was more about growth. So that, you know, that, that takes a lot of pressure. So I think what you're endeavouring to do, Pyfoot's talked about it years ago in adaptive leadership, that sort of concept of getting on the balcony. So I think it's that ability for people to get on the balcony and have a perspective um, and from that, they learn that I'm not my performance today. Um, I'm not my performance over the weeks. I am who I am. And my performance is something that I do. Um, and it's a critical part of me. And, um, and there's no question if that's not going well, I'm going to start to, so to experience some of those elements of self-doubt and so on. How do I then get that perspective back? Um and, and I'd go back to ADEP, well, maybe some partnering, maybe some rebooting the energy levels up again that's possibly dropped away. Maybe we need to develop some different skills or mindset or approach. So, um, so sorry to come back to that same frame, but to me it's so useful to be able to make sense of the sort of challenges that you're talking about. It, it very much is because the, the last one of that is the, the partner. And I tend to think that, and, and just some of the research I've read as well, is that a lot of times people, a lot of high performers tend to insulate themselves as more yeah. troubles come. They tend yeah. to just clamor down and yeah, do. put them, put themselves on an Island. And I, I think about myself and that was my natural habit is to bunker down and say, I'm going to figure this problem out. I just need more time to do it. Instead of going for help, I just yeah. bunker and close off. So um, I, I think that's a very applicable thing there because community is valuable, but it seems that a lot of times that's the last thing that we tend to do. We tend to be think of ourselves think as superheroes. Right. Yeah, I, I was running a session in Melbourne, Australia, last week with a group of um, a group of about forty leaders who our, our defence department here have this sort of um, early to mid career um, acceleration program. So they bring forty people in who have already been quite effective in careers outside of defence, um, and then bring them into defence and see whether they can give them a, a twelve month experience. So they do two, two six months placements, um, mainly in defence science and technology. Um, and yeah, I was brought in to have a conversation with them around resilience and psychological safety. Um, and, and, I, and I sort of said to them at the start, you know, you, you might be wondering what you've got yourselves into, given that three hours into your program, and they've brought a psychologist along to talk to you about resilience and psych safety. So you can imagine the sort of challenges that you that you might be facing going ahead. Um, but I, I think it's normalising that. It's, um, it's you know, the, the, the process that we went through there was just get them to think about, you know, uh, we, we always call a psychologist awareness, acceptance, action. So it's like, I need to be aware of my strengths, my weaknesses, what I'm feeling. As I said then, look, I just got up on stage. I've been feeling a bit nervous. I'm, I'm, I was expecting that. Um, I could accept that or I could catastrophize that. You're going to also experience times, as you say, when uh, am I aware that I'm over narrowing? Am I aware that I'm becoming isolated? Am I aware that I'm a bit angry and frustrated? Am I aware that I'm avoiding something? Okay, let's firstly accept that is human nature. We are wired to do that. <laughs> yeah, we are wired to avoid threats and to get back to certainty. Um, but we also know that what we what we do um, best within our yeah you know, in anything that we're doing is when we go towards an opportunity, go towards the goal, go towards what we want to do, go towards being the best we can be, rather than to protect ourselves. So to me, the first piece of this puzzle is awareness. The second piece is acceptance that I'm a human being. I am not going into a high performance environment without self doubt, without fear without anxiety um, and without some default things that are going to degrade my performance. The question then is, can I then accept that and then move forward? Um, and typically then it's that. So what are the tools I need to move forward? Um, and 
Um, I mean, as you can probably gather from my background, I'm a bit of a pragmatist. You know, there's, there's an old rule in performance psychology says the last thing you learn is the first thing that falls apart under pressure. So uh, to me, that basically means whatever you're going to do, do something that's practiced and make sure it's pretty simple. One of the most practiced and simple tools we've all got is the short-term goal. <laughs> um, talk, talk to special military, talk to emergency medicine, talk to anybody operating these really high stakes, first responder environments. They will assess a situation, break it down into what can we do and move towards the first goal. So that to me is that awareness, acceptance, action is such a simple mental model. You hear pilots say the same thing, aviate, navigate, communicate, keep the plane in the air, navigate to find somewhere to land it, communicate to ensure the support there when you land. So it's those simple mental models that you're endeavouring to embed in yourself and in others that are your tools. They're, they're your mental toolkit that you go to um, when, when you're in these high demand environments. Hmm. Man, I really love that. Um, you mentioned superpower a while back and I wanted to go, cause a lot of times we, we hear, uh, this is another thing that we hear people talk about. And I have my own theory on how do you find your superpower, but yeah. with, your, with yourself, how did you realize that you found your superpower or how'd you go about it? Um, I think probably, uh, yeah, I'll probably go back to the conversations again with a couple of people I've used as mentors and, and one who I've used as a coach for a number of years. And I think both of them helped me to recognize that um, I've got lots of memories of experiences of, you know, work, being an athlete and being in business and, yeah, doing big speaking events and, you know, doing working on challenging assignments and so on. And as humans, we have this natural tendency to look back on those and remember all the things that we did wrong. Um, like, oh, my goodness, I was nervous. I felt doubt. I felt like as an imposter and so on. And I think what both of those two people did was they helped me to extract out of that, that the reality was you actually did really well. Mm -hmm. um, and once you felt, um, I don't know, the language we often use is once you felt about the same size as the mountain. So it wasn't too big, wasn't too small. Um, you're in that kind of flow zone. Um, what, 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 did, what did you see? What did you find? And, and I was like, oh. Well, I'm really creative. I mean, I'm energetic. I'm intelligent. Um, I love to move things forward. Um, I'm practical. I'm pragmatic. You go, okay, well, they're probably your superpowers. So now how do you create the space to play to your superpower? And that's what we've just been talking about a few moments ago is developing my awareness. And that's what you're doing with athletes is, mm -hmm. um, yeah, yeah, a psychologist doesn't help an athlete to do anything that they can't physically already do. Right. Um, question is, how do you do it? in what potentially, and it's not very helpfully called the biggest day of your life, because one of the ways not to do it is to call it the biggest day of your life. <laughs> but um, yeah. So it's almost then, and if that's the case, and when you said that right there, I thought that was interesting because I don't think I've ever heard that usually for people to not say, hey, this is the biggest age of your life, or this yeah. is the biggest moment of your life. Um, yeah. yeah, I think that's the first time I've ever heard that. And is that, it's better to be in neutral is that kind of how you would approach them? Yeah, I think it's recognising that, uh, you know, six, three months, six months, 12 months, whatever, leading up to an event, you, it's really helpful to have a level of motivation to do mm -hmm. your preparation. I mean, that's what anxiety is all about. Anxiety says uh, there's a threat coming, get ready. Um, so, so in some respects, I think, um, that's useful, but also the sort of motivation that, you know, I want to go to the Olympics. I want to, you know, I want to excel and so on, but, but what you want to do closer to the event is not get ahead of yourself and also not get um, not take on pressures that you can't do anything about. Um, and, and I've seen athletes, had athlete, had numerous athletes sort of say to me over the time, the thing I found most challenging about the Olympics wasn't the people in my sport, it was the people in other sports. And you start to think about that like, are you kidding? And people find it hard to believe, but you walk into an athlete village when you've got these yeah, massive, tall basketballers, huge weightlifters. You know, you've got track athletes and rowers and kayakers in the best shape of their lives. It's pretty easy to get intimidated. Um, so what, what to me, what, a, what, a, a, what the best athletes have been able to do is develop that ability to, not, not totally to cocoon themselves, but at least to be able to recognise 
there's an area here where I want to bring my energy to that I can do something about. Mm-hmm. There's a whole lot of other stuff that I can't. Um, and and what I want to be able to do is to, to, to sort of bring my best in that moment, trust myself to bring my best in that moment. And for the vast majority, it's just not helpful to be saying, yeah, today's grand final day. It's useful a while back because it got you out of bed and got you in the gym. But today, we're just going to go and do business. Um, we're going to go and enjoy ourselves. We're going to go and celebrate how good we can be. Let's see how good we can be in this environment. Mm-hmm. That's what you're looking for, not, well, if I do well, I'm going to win Olympic gold medal. You're not going to be thinking about what you need to do. Mm-hmm. I, I love that. And so I, I want to do a quick overview of some of the concepts from from the recent book here, because I, mm-hmm. I think it's a very important topic, because I think in the world of business, and you you probably know this better than most of us, is that I feel like there's there's a radical shift in terms of how we do work, how we do yep. business, and and everything has just been flipped up on uh, side of its head. So yeah. Um. So one of the concepts in the book that I thought was interesting was the defensive mindset. Yeah. And um, uh, could you just briefly explain what's the kind of the, the opposite of that in terms of like it says defeat the defensive mindset and how do we even fall into that trap? Yeah, I think it's pretty much what we were talking about a few moments ago of this tendency that we all have to go toward to 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 be to receive a threat. So you go into a business meeting. You know, you think you think people listening today they go to a meeting today or tomorrow, and it's a it's a reasonably high stakes meeting. So there are a variety of threats in that meeting. Yeah, there's threats of loss of control. There's threats of loss of certainty. There's the sense of do I appear to be capable and competent, um, and so on. So all of those things can easily cause us to 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 as you said earlier to sort of become a little more isolated, and we become defensive. So we tend to protect ourselves. Um, and the sort of examples of that, if you're a more task oriented person, you might become more perfectionistic um, and and just keep tweaking something. Um, you might become more competitive, but not in a not in a go towards the goal, but you're too worried about comparison to somebody else. So we were just talking about the Olympics a moment ago. Uh, you might become over controlling and you might therefore lose others and cause that sort of sense of rift with others. Or on the other hand, you might become more passive. So it's this sort of almost like aggressive, defensive or passive, defensive. And passive is like, I avoid the decision. I you know, stay away from the conflict or whatever. That's that natural defensive reaction. And most of us get it um, because that is that, oh, um, it's the fight flight free mm-hmm. sort of thing. Um, the opposite of that to me is a sort of a mix of growth mindset meets adaptability. And we call it adaptive mindset. Um and that's that I'm going towards my goal. I'm clear what my vision is. I want to engage and coach my people. Um, so how do I go towards that versus uh, being defensive? And I think most, again, most of your listeners would would recognize that, you know, think about what is it that your natural triggers are. And I personally, um, I'll tend to get more perfectionistic. Um, I tend to get a little more controlling. Um, that's my tendency to react. Okay, that's going to work okay perhaps in the short term there's likely to be a cost to that what are the costs uh well perfectionistic um stress uh controlling uh probably going to lose a bit of initiative from some of my team may not communicate things as well probably not creating enough creativity and so on so it's just that awareness of the defensive um and when, when we asked um uh, there's a brilliant um, leader in Australia, Tanya Munro. She's our chief defence scientist. Um, and um, I asked her, she runs Defence Science Technology, so they have thousands of defence scientists and researchers and so on working you know, in Australia, but also the AUKUS sort of alliance now as well. And um, yeah, I said to her, look, if, if, you, if you think of defence science technology and, and the environment your people are working in, what do you see the biggest challenge is? Um, and I thought she would have said critical thinking, keeping up with technology, collaboration. She went straight to the defensive mindset. She said her biggest challenge is, is to keep our minds open to what the opportunities are while we're so overwhelmed by all of the challenge and change and so on. It's so easy for people to become defensive and to settle back into their yeah, their, their tried and tested routines, which is, as you said, Julian, the world's changed dramatically. And and we found that with Toolkit for Turbulence, we interviewed 15, and Tanya was one of them, 15 um, top executives uh, about their experience of turbulence from COVID moving forward. Um, and the types of turbulence, they're everywhere. The AI, um, supply chain challenges, the geo geopolitical issues, the inflation, you know, capital markets, all sorts of different turbulence. But all of those had that same human effect. The danger is if we're defensive, 
we're not going to bring out our best self. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the other things uh, on there was a uh, anchor on personal values. And I thought that was interesting yeah. and black swan decisions. Now we've heard of black swan events, but I don't yeah. think I've heard the phrase black swan decisions. So I thought that was interesting. Yeah. Um, I mean, anchor on per personal values, um, that originated, my, my co-author of Toolkit for Turbulence is uh, Professor Martin Bain. So Martin's Martin's fascinating background. He was the vice chancellor of one of Australia's largest universities. Um, so 80, 90,000 students. Um, he was previously ran the Open University in the UK and, and he was also an executive for a number of years with Microsoft. So he has a really unusual, uh, mm -hmm. unusual background. Um, and he spoke to me just not long after COVID hit. And so Australia's borders were closed. Uh, university of 90,000 students, with many of them um, in international students now locked out of the country. Um, the university also has quite large campuses in, in Asia, um, in, in um, Vietnam, for example, Singapore and so on. Um, and he said to me, um, it's looking now if this continues as, it, as, as we think it might for the next six to nine months, we have around about a $300 million hole in our budget. He said, I I feel like I could be the the and it's called the role is called vice chancellor, so it's the chief executives of the university. He said, I feel like I could be the 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 the, char, the vice chancellor who loses the university. And he said, What would you if I was a cricket or a an Olympic coach facing this challenge? What what would you tell me to do? And um, I thought about it for a few moments, and I said, I think the first thing I'd do would be to get you to anchor on your own personal values, Martin. Um, because I think what you are likely to experience over the next few months is you're going to be asked to make decisions that are going to impact thousands of people um, and you are going to get pulled into the defensive mindset. Uh, and I think what we need to do is to help you to understand in the absence of data, clarity and so on, let's go back to what your core values are and then let's share them with the team. Um, so he went away, he spent probably, well, I sent him back, <laughs> I sent him back three or four times to people he knew well, and he won't mind me saying, because they're in the book, he came back and he said, Graham, I think my core values, and I want him to have a really strong story around each, and Martin has a, quite a significant disability that he's carried all his life, and um, and he talked a lot about how that shaped him, and um, he talked about his three values as courage, care, and mateship. Hmm. He shared those with his team. Um, and then as we face down um, these massive challenges of having to, 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 to eliminate um, jobs and move people out and, and so on, we always came back to how do we balance courage and care? How do we make sure that mateship and relationship is a part of that? Because for Martin, he could anchor on that. Um, and that's what I would encourage people to, to do is to think, are there one or two or three of those anchor values that when everything else is stripped away and you're asked to make a tough call what are the one or two values that you'll you'll make them from and i think that's more powerful than the you know the traditional values on the wall in organizations that can be used well that often are not yeah and um so as we get ready to start winding this conversation down um let's just do some just different questions kind of off the cuffs here and yeah. and one of those is around your consulting firm uh what do you enjoy most about your consulting firm um probably i mean the consulting firm's called think one team mm -hmm. um and it was it i founded it about 15 years ago now when i wrote the book think one team which has been a absolute bestseller in australia it's done a little bit in the states um so if anybody wants to get it in the states that'd be great uh, but it's just come out as its third edition in australia and i think what i love is when think one team comes to life um it's when um i'm speaking to people from organizations or they contact me i got one yesterday i'm working with this global and one of the global insurance companies at the moment we had their executive team into australia a little while back now and their head of people and culture sent me a little note yesterday saying just fantastic can just see people working so much more effectively now i think it's really sparked them that's what I love. I, I think it's exactly what I used to love with with athletes. It's just seeing. I don't know when I when I come back to what do I do. I I I like to help people solve their most complex problems. I like them to help them pursue their biggest opportunities. And I think it's when I see them doing that. Uh, that's what that gives me a spark. Yeah. And so when you hit adversity, what are some of your personal strategies that you uh, use in your toolkit? Um. Probably two or three. I mean, one is just regular fitness. I, I made a commitment to myself 
actually interestingly when you're involved in olympic teams you have to do fitness uh, assessments and i remember the the head of medicine saying to me i thought you would have been really fit because you like used to play oh, <laughs> cricket i'm going yeah used to um so i made myself a commitment that i would do a minimum of three um fitness sessions every week and i made that commitment to myself um in 1996 <laughs> so it's a long time ago um and i can tell you in uh, april for example i had 12 sessions um and i have a heart rate monitor that i use and i just make sure that that so to me that's almost my baseline um uh, the second one is to have my, my simple ADEP framework and the third is to have a couple of people who i value their perspective um because if i'm really struggling I'll give a couple of those mates a call and go, I'm thinking about this, what do you reckon, et cetera. So I think it's fitness, it's then that overarching balance, and then it's I know when I need perspective um, and I get it, yeah. Uh, otherwise, I'll get caught up in my own head. I'm a natural perfectionist, so I will get myself caught up in worrying that, oh, my God, it's going to miss 2% of this, or I'm talking to Julian and I should have said this and I'll go to um, – and, and, yeah, that – that has a huge benefit, but it also has a cost. And um, I, I know when I get stressed that, that yeah, gets the volume goes up on that and somebody needs to go, hey, drop it back down again, fella. You don't need to do this. <laughs> I used to be the same way when I was doing these these mm. uh, inter interviews and everything. And and it's funny mm. now, people think, oh, you're just so naturally extroverted. And, and, and it was, yeah. I'm actually the opposite. And it, yeah. I, it was actually yeah. a, tra a training thing that I had to really work hard at. And at first, you should. I, I had so many notes, like everything was detailed. There was no room for man to maneuver or anything because yeah. I was so nervous about conducting the uh, the conversation and everything. And now it, it's it's just fun now. And kind of like yeah. you said earlier, when you talked about not making it such a huge event that you're just doing this thing today, and yeah. it, it, it it takes so much pressure off of of everything. It does, but and you've earned that. Let me, I'm going to interrupt you, John. You've earned that. Yeah, it's not like, you know, it, it's not like somebody listening today goes, oh, I can't. I'm just going to be all cool and not worry about it and it'll turn out. No, it won't. Julian's put in the hard yards. Yeah, you've mapped it out. You've tested it. You've prepared. That that early stage, you know, to me, that's great preparation. Um, and I've had this conversation with numerous of my clients, uh, numerous of my colleagues, and mm -hmm. psychologists who do similar sort of stuff, and we've all come to the same conclusion that that sort of level of perfectionism, um, but then reduce it down, is a, is is often a really significant characteristic of high performers. So you've done the work to earn the right to be you know, unconsciously competent, which is what you want to be able to do in in uh, yeah in a, in a high performance environment. You'll do the prep, then you can trust. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and th that that ties into the next thing that I, I've been asking people and talking about lately because me, like a lot of other colleagues and friends, are what I would say we're early on our journeys in terms of professional development. And there's this thing of what are you building? What's your end game? Uh, and and a lot of times I, I see people now, especially in this social media world, where yeah. you, could, you could find yourself running someone other's race, where this person wants to build – X amount of valuation for his company, and you may not yeah. want to do that, but you get yourself caught up in that. Yeah. So I tie this back to ask you, what does success mean to you? Um, I think I've always felt that it's um, been a balance of um, levels of, and I've never probably come up with a perfect sort of mission statement definition of it. Mm -hmm. um, but I've always felt that it's a bit of balancing the, you know, I've had a family, so it was always can I can I look and say, I'm not going to, you know, future Graham's not going to look back and go, gee, I wish I'd spent more time with my boys when they grew up or wish I'd invested more in my own health or in my mm -hmm. relationship or in my business. Um, to me, success has always been being able to be, you know, bring the best you, bring the best you can um, to each of those, but recognise that it's, it's an ingredient, it's a balance of those sorts of things. So it's a, so I guess the success is that ability to step back and say, based on my values and what's important to me, I feel like I've got those in in pretty good, pretty good. Yeah, in Australia we would say in pretty good nick, <laughs> which 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 means yeah, I think they're okay in balance. So so I think I'm saying success is a balance, and I suppose I'd contrast that sometimes to uh, people who are incredibly successful in one aspect of their life, mm -hmm. but I. I 
I guess I've seen so much of it as a psychologist of what sits behind the the facade of broken relationships and yeah self doubt and yeah substance abuse and so on. So I um, I think somebody who's comfortable in their own skin um, and who's making a contribution you know that's being successful irrespective of what you're doing how you're doing that. Mm-hmm. And the last question here is if someone comes up to you at a cafe and they ask you, what are one to three things that I can start doing today to create a more resilient mindset and set myself up to become more of a sustained peak performer? Um, yeah. What would you, t- what would you tell them? Um, I might just say exactly what I have always said to any of the athletes I work with um, and assuming they've done a bit of work already. Mm-hmm. Um, I would say the critical uh, the critical issue in any in any high demand environment, and you you wanting to put yourself into a high demand environment, is trust. And there are three things to trust that will enable that will bring you composure and confidence in that environment. The first is trust in yourself. So make sure you put in the preparation that you can trust in yourself. Um, trust in your colleagues. Trust in the people around you that you can be vulnerable with them, so that they can help you to be the best that you can be. And then trust in your game plan. So make sure that you have a game plan, that you're clear what the steps are that you want to take. Not the certainty we talked earlier, but the clarity. So I, I think I would say that. Yeah, trust in yourself, trust in your colleagues, trust in your game plan. That's what's likely to bring you composure and confidence. Um, but that requires work, like any other aspect in life. It's not a simple little switch that you flick on and off. Hmm. Such is the thing with life that it's a constant, it's about constant evolution and constant growth. Exactly. Yeah. Getting to know it yourself more and more so that you, I mean, we, we use these things called user guides when we do team thing, team activities, and each person has to develop their own user guide. Mm-hmm. And it's a guide to who they are and they share it with the team. And it's like, this is who I am. And this is what brings out the best in me. And this is how I interact and so on. So it's, it's getting to know your own user guide. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And so that's a perfect way to put a bow on this conversation. I really, really enjoyed this conversation. I probably could have talked to you for two, three hours. <laughs> um, and so um, lastly, uh, where can listeners keep up with you and uh, all your adventures and and everything that you're doing in this world? Um, LinkedIn is where I probably uh, spend most of my time social. So Graham Winter um, mm-hmm. at LinkedIn. Um, and uh, Think One Team is pretty simple. So thinkoneteam.com. Um, that's the easy place to um, people can sort of see books and uh, resources and things like that as well. Um, and look, thank you as well. I've really appreciated the conversation. Um, you are a master at just creating the environment in which people can have a really friendly and open and uh, engaging conversation. So I really appreciate it. Thanks, Julian. Well, I appreciate that as well. And listeners out there, I will have all those show notes and those links in there to everything that he mentioned, plus a few more things that I dig up and find. And until next time, stay awesome, be limitless, and as always, go be the CEO of your health and your life. Peace.